ICCM Conversations. How might community music develop? Let's get started. Um, thank you all so much for joining today. It's wonderful to see so many new people join us and to have um, many familiar uh, faces here. We're really looking forward to continuing our ICCM conversation series with you today. Um, today we're going to be considering the question, how might community music develop? And um, to me, this feels like quite a timely uh, question to explore as we continue to think about different ways of working. So for today, for example, we're meeting together online, whereas traditionally we might have met in person at a symposium or a conference or an event. Um, really great to have Lee Higgins um, uh, leading on an ICCM Conversations event. As many of you will know, Lee is the director of the International Centre for Community Music. He's the editor of the International Journal of Community Music. The, what's your Ismay president title for past president, Lee? Oh no, it's past, past president now, isn't it? So I've, I've, I'm just, I'm just a member of Ismay now, but I have, I've, I've paid my dues. That's how I look at it. Lee was the president of the International Society for Music Education and I won't tell you any more about Lee because he can tell you about himself oh except that um he's wonderful uh and uh, we can start the session now Lee I'll hand over to you well thanks very much it's great it's been fabulous to see the development of the ICCM uh, events and now um um, I've volunteered to lead one myself. So welcome to everybody. It's great to see so many people uh, here at, uh, on this call. And um, this, uh, as you can see, this, this um, presentation is in, in a number of parts. I'm gonna begin by offering a provocation, a very short provocation uh, around the question of how might community music develop? Um, followed by a breakout and then and there's an articulation in the second part after the breakout of four questions and a concept that might be helpful in stimulating discussion which is followed by um, the breakout of 20 minutes and then we are going to take a review of the responses and invite you to speak against uh, to them if you wish and then finally I'm going to offer myself it felt only right that I offered a brief um, reflection as regards to my current thinking around this um, question. So here is the, uh, the presentation, uh, the um, provocation. In 2018, the introduction to the Oxford Handbook of Community Music suggested the emerging voices, agendas and contexts pertinent to the book's 57 authors was an indication that the field is continuing to expand diversify and mature. Deemed as a field that had come of age, the assumption acknowledged the convergence of decades of practical activity with the growth in both research and scholarship. Three years after its publication, the field appears to remain on a trajectory of growth, evidenced by articles, book chapters, PhD thesis, and books in English, but importantly, other languages also. German, Italian, Korean, and Chinese. And you can see the images of those books there. There has also been continued interest in supporting courses within institutes of higher education. Only this month, I heard about programs in Portugal and Greece and chatted to the organizers there. It's a very um, exciting development. But there's also been a prolification of online activities throughout the year 2020, continuing into 2021, of course, which has attracted regular and diverse audiences. These include the ISME CMA assemblies, and of course, the, the, the events that we've been hosting, the ICCM events, as well as uh, the stuff from Community Music Learning, led by Alicia de Banfi Hall. At its most powerful, the practice has provided a critical response to issues such as music inclusion, diversity, cultural democracy, and non-formal music learning. 
and has played an important role in offering illustrations of practice and conceptual interrogation within the areas of social justice, popular music pedagogies, lifelong musical learning, music and le leisure and artistic citizenship. In the discussion paper, you can decide there's citations against that if you want to uh, um, look into that yourself. The purpose of the question that I'm proposing today, how might community music develop, is therefore to prompt those involved with its practice to pause just for a moment and reflect. Development implies a consideration of growth, advancement, elaboration or a maturing. My question is, I hope, encouragement for those involved in community music to reflect upon its current standing within its own terms of reference, but also within the broader parameters of music making, teaching and learning. The question is open, containing a might rather than an ought or a should, and thus points towards opportunities to explore its challenge individually or collaboratively. It is a chance to wonder or imagine community music's future in terms of impact, arts policy, pedagogic enterprise, music in and research. So we're going to move into our first breakout group straight away. As Joe said, this was a quick provocation. And we are um, and we would like you to consider the following questions. As a field of practice, how do you assess its current status? Has the field been impactful? If so, how and what examples demonstrate this? Has, the community, has community music been unsuccessful in any ways? If so, what examples might be given? So we'd like you in your breakout groups now, and Ryan is assigned those great breakout groups, we'd like you to uh, spend 15 minutes considering these questions, unpacking these questions even, and begin to put up some of your comments on the Google Doc. And then after 15 minutes, we'll, we'll come back together and we'll push forward on the um, central question of this conversation. First off, so, the yeah. unsuccessful for me is a very interesting one versus had an unplanned outcome. But that's probably mm -hmm. another uh, what does unsuccessful mean? Oh, that's a good question. But um, mm -hmm. maybe start with the positives. I don't know. Um, it's so interesting because I'm immediately just going into COVID thinking about mm -hmm. how resilient our field has been during the pandemic and how so many of the organizations that I'm in connection with, primarily through SoundSense and being the chair and getting more familiar with organizations is how much work people have done. Like when we talk about the current status in terms of responding to the pandemic. I think it's outshined a lot of other sectors. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. The coral, I know that the, the coral field in Canada, especially has um, like the national association coral Canada <clears throat> has done an incredible amount of work to continue, you know, to offer seminars and webinars and, you know, in order to get people online at the beginning and then to help them facilitate in community music, um, community choral organizations and such. It's been, yeah, it's been pretty prolific, the the kinds of things that have happened, especially in something, it, it's difficult doing things online, particularly in terms of actual practice online because of latency and such, but to actually move the field itself and and the especially um when it comes to like music education um part of things the pedagogy um and also just networking with people bringing people across the whole i mean obviously our country is huge so to bring people from coast to coast to coast together um in the coral fields specifically it's been pretty incredible what's happened yeah it's interesting, though, because if we talk about a response to COVID and then look at it in the bigger picture of the current status, but also just the the capacity of the field in general about resilience, being responsive and flexible practitioners, then I think, you know, our current status is pretty good. Mm -hmm. if, if It depends on what you're judging. <clears throat> 
what you what markers you're judging it by um, mm. I think it's quite interesting this idea of like I think we phrased it in the document as like a community to music project as in the the broader design and development and evolution as it as a, an area of practice and and I think I think the point about COVID and the responsiveness is is so important and because it's the it's the transferable nature of how community practitioners work and and being able to find those malleable points to make it work in all sorts of mm -hmm. contexts. But but most importantly, probably for me, things that I'm thinking about just now is the how and where it's rooted through these broader social justice aims and I suppose if we think about community music as a broader project as a an area of development um or an area that has developed like it's whatever our current moment happened to be whether it was coronavirus or whether it was an issue of access in our music classrooms that we work in like I think community musicians are exceptional in finding ways to to respond to important moments and I so I wonder when I think about I think it is a good opportunity for reflection and I wonder could we what's the next step how do you how do you communicate this part of community music's history that's what I'm interested in and capitalize on it yeah and I think more so than ever I just had a conversation this morning with a group of choral leaders and actually being optimistic and thinking ahead about how do we come back together into a space. But actually we all identified that now more, more than ever, we're aside from potentially the digital poverty situation, but we are being so inclusive to people who um, uh, didn't feel comfortable traveling to that space or that room and how we engage those um, participants and our community going forward in a way that actually we're still going to be working digitally, I think, going forward as well as sort of face to face in a room. And so there's an added element there of accessibility for people because um, of just practicalities of potentially we're now engaging with people who couldn't have left their houses before or this kind of another route that it's all taken. And it just chimes on to the sort of resilience side of it all as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And I think, too, in terms of that, uh, it's a really good point about accessibility. Uh, and as you obviously stated, like there are also <clears throat> accessibility issues for some people. But um, a choir that I engage with in, in England, uh, the Childless Voices Choir, um, for these women, many of these women, um, they have been sort of rendered in many ways voiceless in some aspects of their lives. And to be able to come together online in a way because everybody's muted. Um, it actually al allow, has allowed a lot of these women, these childless women to, um, to use their voices for the first time without, like in a way where perhaps they wouldn't want to share their voice among others. Uh, so it's, it's been really interesting looking at that kind of, uh, you know, in terms of for people, also for people who perhaps have been told they can't sing and those kinds of things. And then suddenly they're able to participate in a different way where others aren't even able to hear them and it can begin to build their confidence. Mm. We're talking about, we're kind of through the, through the lens of COVID a wee bit, but bringing in Ruth's point a bit about the kind of the the bigger context but we are in essence assessing the current status and talking about the impact at the same time mm -hmm. in that we are reaching people we hadn't before and there mm -hmm. is there is a justice in that that perhaps we need to you know and an ethical dilemma that amanda brought up around how do we have opened the doors to a participant in the philippines uh, and then say well now that we're in person we have no more offer for you when we have created those spaces and those offers. So, you know, that, that's something that comes up around impact as well. Mm -hmm. um, I also wondered whether this, I mean, I think that I feel like COVID, the COVID situation has brought this more to light, but in terms of the impact of um, community music on well being. Because I, you know, when people are unable to gather together in person, um, 
I, I think that there there seems to be an impact that that is having on people's well being, even if they're able to join things online. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a different kind of connection, and so I I feel for myself that this that COVID has shown me that even more. I mean, there's been you know lots of research done on on community music and well being, but this this inability to actually physically be there for so many people around the world i think it's it's even more um obvious the the impact on people's well-being the positive impact on people's well-being that community music practice has mm. um no i was really quickly was just going to say that it's the my question now is the the what next what role and responsibility do we have mm-hmm. as as leaders in this field in whichever way that manifests to make the right noise to the right places so that the disruption um the the digital thing is facilitated doesn't get left behind so that that's about leadership my question is about leadership that's my thing yeah okay welcome back everybody um and move on to part two and we're going to consider this question how might community music develop so i'd like us now to consider this question it's an opportunity to take a meta view and think about how you would like to see the field of community music practice develop. How do you envision the practice of community music in the future? Before we do this though, I'd like to offer four concepts that might help our thinking. And these concepts are labeled as becoming machine, difference and rhizome. These ideas have been adapted from the work of Gilles Deleuze and his collaborator Felix Guitari who produced a body of work of thought accumulating in the late 20th century. Before I start, I would like to offer three reasons for why Deleuze and Guitari. In my previous work, I have considered community music as acts of hospitality, friendship, intervention, facilitation, event, boundary walkers, safe space, and non-formal music learning and improvisation. Throughout this body of work, I have predominantly been engaged with ideas that have a lineage that resonate with Deleuze and Guitari, broadly speaking, post-structuralism. As such, their ideas offer a way of understanding community music that is already somewhat in sync with my own. The second reason is understood under the broad umbrella of post-structural thinking, Deleuze and Guitari challenges the possibility that there are foundational knowledges. Deleuze saw this as a cause for celebration and liberation an opportunity to accept the challenge to transform life and a chance to think about how to open up new regions for living. In my mind, the revolutionary aspects of their work has resonance with the history of community music as social activism. And thirdly, for Deleuze and Guitari, concepts are there to move us beyond our current experiences towards thinking of new possibilities. Concepts are understood as creative or active acts rather than representative, descriptive, or simplifying. They express this in the following way. Philosophy is the art of forming, inventing, and fabricating concepts. Community music seeks to provide springboards for creative expression. And Deleuze and Guitari's notion of concepts as as invention provides, well, for me at least, tangible links between community music practices and theoretical integration. So let's consider these four concepts. The first one, community music as becoming. Those working in community music are often challenged as regards to what it is. This question has been dominant in community music's historical narrative and has been both problematized and challenged, resulting in a general proposition suggesting that activities named community music are just too diverse, complex, multifaceted and contextual to be captured in one universal statement of meaning. In short, the question that seeks an is seeks to fix an identity. Alternative ways of describing community music have been explored by describing what it does and through listing distinctive uh, traits, example in global practices and characteristics as ideals. Engaging with the Deleuzean concept of becoming might provide community music as an alternative, an alternative framework through which to consider the question of its identity. Using the lenses of becoming would affirm that community music is always in a state of emergence. From this perspective, community music is always becoming different, always in flux, 
and always in a continual flow of change. So for the group that's going to the becoming group, the question I would like people to consider is, can community music be described as always in a state of emergence? If so, what are the dangers and what are the possibilities? So there'd be five groups that are cons will be considering this question. The second concept that might enable us to respond to the larger question. If, as those involved in the field suggest, community music has no fixed identity because it's too diverse, complex and multifaceted, then there appears the possibility that its practice is in fact multiple, an assemblage or constellation of approaches to music making with people that seeks relevance depending on context. How community musicians operationalize their approach, for example, ways of interacting with participants, funders, workshop design, pedagogic strategy or evaluation, has the affect or effect of releasing different expressions of the work. Through this way, community music has the potential to be many things. Deleuze and Guitari use the concept of the machine as one approach to discuss how potentials might be realized. Take a musical instrument like a guitar, for example. In and of itself, it doesn't do anything. However, when a human body connects with it, the combination brought about through connections enables something to happen. The obvious and most common way of actualizing the guitar would be to play chords, a melody, or a blues riff. The human body becomes a guitarist or a musician. Different connections, however, would produce different outcomes. The guitar could become reimagined as a work of art by painting it and mounting it on the wall. The human body would then become an artist. The guitar could become a source of heat by burning the wood on a fire or be stripped of its raw materials, the strings refashioned as a hand or neck jewelry. The potential of the guitar could therefore be actualized in many different ways. So the question here is, what are the potentials of community music and how might these be realized? The third concept is community music as a practice of difference. How many of us that teach community music demonstrate its doing through the use of games, exercises and strategies that we know are replicable because we have been using them for years? How many community musicians utilize the same approach across multiple contexts, employing tried and tested strategies that are known to bring about desired outcomes? Although there are many understandable reasons for working in this way, should we have concerns? For example, as the field develops and expands, should the field be advocating a community music pedagogy? Should community musicians be seeking to articulate stable categories in order to capture how it does what it does? There may be some very practical reasons for doing so, but will this limit its growth and contradict its historical roots? By focusing on difference, Deleuze's philosophy involves thinking outside of representation, exploring instead of how things change over time. He does not dismiss perspectives that seek stability, just that they might limit our horizons of possibilities. Deleuze's notion of difference might be described as that which eludes capture, a resistance, for example, to the development of a model that would advocate for methodological compliance. So those are in the group of difference. The question I would like you to consider is, should community musicians seek to develop pedagogic strategies that are responsive in multiple and complex contexts while resisting methodological crystallization? If so, what might this look like? If not, what are the alternatives? The final concept we'd like you to consider is community music as a riser. Drawing upon its etymological meaning as root and its botanical use to describe a plant stem system that sends out roots and shoots from its nodes, rhizomatic thinking challenges that which is grounded through a fixed and individual tree-like base. As a metaphor, the tree is rooted in one place with clear lines of demarcation. There is a clear beginning, middle and end. The different parts of its hierarchy work well together. It is a static system with well-defined roles. As an idea, rhizome puts forth a concept that resists rigid categories and in turn creates a strategy through which we can challenge previous ways of thinking. Acting in a rhizomatic way is not simply a process that assimilates things, rather it is a milieu of perpetual transformation, ceaselessly establishing new connections. So our question here, 
is where are the opportunities for community musicians to intersect with other fields? So what we've done now is that we've allocated the same groups that you were just in um, just now, that discussing the broader issues around community music um, status. And we'd like you to consider uh, those questions that we've that I've just been putting up in those groups and those concepts that um, I've just very briefly outlined are there to help you if they're helpful for you at all to respond to you. So each group will now be allocated one concept along with a set of questions to begin the conversation. Well, I do hope that that was um, an interesting discussion um, for you. Let me say that the, that the question, how might community music developed is something that's just been bubbling up in my mind for a few months, really. It is a large question and it does offer us the opportunity to think in, in meta ways. And when thinking about how we might run a conversation like this in this type of format, we had these, I had these four components that you've been discussing. And one which was about emergence, the second one which is about community music's potential the third one is about the methods potentially that it employs. And the fourth one around intersection, intersecting fields. So we've, it's quite disparate to some extent. It's a very large question. This is just the beginning of a conversation and the beginning of some thinking. So uh, in that sense, um, we provided a, an opportunity to respond that was in line to some extent to Deleuze and Guitari's kind of bit more chaotic thing. But we've tried to highlight um, a, a, a few things that I'm seeing on the Google Doc that I'm look, looking at here. And what I'd like to do is I just read out a few of the things and maybe invite people from that Eva wrote that or the groups that contributes that maybe to respond to that. So we'll have just kind of an opportunity we've got for only a short period of time 15 minutes just to kind of respond to that so i'm just going to take the group the becoming group which, which was all about um community music as potentially always in a state of an emergence what were the dangers of this and what were the possibilities in thinking uh, this way so there's a couple of things highlighted i know i read read uh, i read them out while community music is emerging this group writes is there need for providing a stable environment for the young people we can see a tension here. So that tension between stability and emergence. And this kind of dovetails with, uh, it could be the same group, I'm not sure, but the work is often experimental. So the fact that our work is experimental, it's improvisation, it's these types of things. Practice always evolves, yes. But at the same time, children need stability. Formalizing has a danger of not listening to the participant voices anymore. So that again, we're really seeing those tensions. So can I invite the people from the, that becoming group, whoever wants to speak and maybe talk a little bit about that conversation it would be fabulous. I think the best way I, to do it. I yeah. can, um, we didn't get to the second part, second question about the dangers, but I think we just discussed a lot of yeah, we found tensions that the ones that you've just read, which were always about, on the one hand, we need a language to describe things to make th to make ourselves understood, you know, or we need to have a practice that gives stability. At the same time, things always change and we, we have a very experimental practice. Um, um, so I think the exact everyone had examples that sort of always found we found them in the two in these two areas, you know, one on the one hand the need for stability on the one on the other the the practice that experimental that responds to the people that responds to the context and therefore is not the same so there's yeah so that was basically i think please others in the group add but that was we we our conversation circled around that a lot of the time i think i would just add yeah the, the, a lot of our conversation was around you know where where does this change come from who influences that and where, where are the voices of the young people themselves in this in in helping to 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 engineer a change if they want it you know i think it's a lot of it has to begin it's that whole pedagogy of walking alongside them you learn as much from the young people as they learn from you absolutely 
Great. Thanks, Steve and Alicia. Is there anyone from that group? Because Alicia did mention that there were some examples of that. So it would be quite nice to if you want to offer up some examples of where that where you've seen those tensions happen between emergence and stability. I think in terms of formalizing pedagogies that we have in community music, there can be the danger that when we're passing on ideas to maybe people that we're mentoring or maybe we're sharing ideas, there can become an idea that this is how you work with this certain group of people. And I've seen that happen in practice where someone has decided that this is the practice we must have. And so they've stopped reading the room. They've stopped looking at what the context is now. And I think that's that's a, something that we've got to address. I really appreciate that, Anne. And also what you've done very neatly there is demonstrate that that all these things are connected there, although we've itemized them and atomized them for the sake of this type of discussion. Of course, you've just talked exactly about methodological and the idea of community music as difference. So there's a real bleed over on, on all of them. So uh, I appreciate that. Well, let's look at the, the group that was titled Machine, which was really about potentials um, and that idea of what is what could, might be the potentials of community music and I've just highlighted one here and it um, the front end says it imposed imposed versus natural constraints and limitations and I was taken by this being maybe easier to work within constraints than within a total open forum so I think we're getting some of those tensions again but this is around the idea of the potentials of community music or how they might be realized. So can we have somebody from one of those groups to kind of talk, you know, tell us what you, you was chatting about? We were the ones that were talking about that, Lee, and um, we hadn't gotten, I mean, we'd begun that discussion, but I don't think we unpicked that particular point around the constraints actually that, that much. It's just something that we're working with a lot at the moment um, in my class around, you know, chosen constraints and working within them and how they actually can be quite liberating um, versus just having far too much to choose from and thereby actually potentially being frozen by that. Um, but I don't know if that really was the the nub of, of kind of what we discussed. We did tangent a bit, but good tangents and related tangents, but perhaps um, Amanda, Laura, Ruth would want to say something else because I don't, I think it was a bit all over and um, yeah i mean we did we did go sl slightly tangential but on the idea of what the possibilities are and how they might be realized we we talked we had a fantastic conversation to be quite frank and um although i did a lot of talking so i'm probably biased but um we talked about what um you know the the things about community practice and the the kind of the the different parts of that that intersect over um, maybe less familiar spaces where community music might happen. So we thought about um, how what the practice looks like with different kinds of partnerships that are maybe not so familiar to um, music education in its broadest sense. And then we moved on to talk about um, the difficulty of advocating in, in the kind of the structural support for a sense of advocating the complexities of community music. Uh, I talked a little bit about, um, you know, dealing with some of the restraints and Jess had mentioned the idea of working creatively within conditions. And I suggested maybe that that was also conditions of the uh, ways that the projects and things are resourced. That's where we went with it. And how may they be realised? We we need we need uh, funded and critical spaces where community music can be talked about in different ways. I'll jump over difference right now, and I'll move on to the rhizome group, which was about intersecting fields. And again, just to be really clear, all these components are all woven together for this much larger question. So we're beginning to unpack some of these. And um, so something from the in the rhizome group there was talk of co-creativity and common purpose and one group talked of community music as one node connecting with another 
non-musical node and there was a question mark there and I'm interested in that I'm interested how community music what are the opportunities to intersect and we often talk about music therapy music ed ethnomusicology etc but where else might those uh, opportunities uh, arise so I wonder if anybody from the one of the rhizome group might talk to us a little bit about some of the things you were talking about Um, well, um, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, we talked about the way in which uh, community music can connect with lots of different genres and that there is a certain sense, well, it's, it's just the difficulty of defining what community music is and that very often lots of different types of communities or community group organisations have an aspect of co-creativity and uh, shared creativity in them is what we kind of identified as being something that was common. Okay, great. Thanks. Yes. Yeah, so that's so again, it's it's doubling back onto some of those those other things. So um, and, and yeah, and I think there's a lot of we talk about potentials, a lot of potential for community music to make connections with other fields. I know, for example, one of the, the projects we did uh, around with cultural geography, for example, that's really opened up a, a really interesting lens through which to see community music and community music has provided a sort of lens through which to look at issues of cultural geography. So there's some of the potentials and some of the intersections of that. Um, of difference, the field of difference. Can I invite somebody? I've noticed that some things have gone up there. I didn't see them in advance. So can I invite someone from the, the difference group to talk? And this was really about method. Again, very similar to lots of to some extent, but it was about that we have this multiple and complex context. But what happens when we move towards what I've described as methodological crystallization? And Anne uh, Jones uh, spoke specifically about that earlier on. So could someone from the difference group want to take the floor. I could give it a first try and then invite the others in. Um, we basically all agreed, we, we all had, had the impulse to say no, actually we don't need uh, any crystallization, any um, pedagogical strategies that we could um, kind of uh, zoom in on or, or uh, postulate as something universal, but rather we felt that community music as a field provides enough framework enough values and principles behind it to uh, to then uh, you know be, be flexible enough to to respond to the group you're working with um, and we then went into the question what is alternatives um, and we felt that possibly the necessity there is a necessity to to find exchange and something like uh, intervision, supervision, um, peer to peer exchange um, as a way of deepening experiences of uh, digesting experiences. And then of course, through that going on with our own learning. That's pretty much what I have in my mind, but Kate or Lynn or Emily, maybe you want to add something. Oh, no, I appreciate that, Marion. Um, I'm mindful of the time here. Uh, it's been clearly stimulating conversations across those three areas of which there's much more to say, but this is a conversation and it is at the beginnings of something. I'm going to move to my kind of my offering really to, to the group. It felt right that if I'm going to pose the question, I ought to at least have a pop at it at myself or offer some things. So I'm going to go into that. It's probably about five or six minutes long and then we're, we're going to come back and we can have a much more open uh, open discussion so i'm just going to reshare my screen again and take you through just some final thoughts from me so <clears throat> community music has seen a tremendous amount of global growth over the last decade supported by healthy engagement with research and scholarship the increase of national and international conversations, a growth of learning and research opportunities in schools of music and universities, and a steady flow of scholarly writing has nourished the practice. As a consequence, distinctive and recognizable traits have enabled representation, carving out a domain of, of 
yeah, definable activity that has accountable histories, practical application and research. This is an achievement and is to be celebrated. But what are the implications of this for a field that ranks people, participation and context as key drivers and has inheritances within movements of activism and resistance? Community music considered through a Deleuzean frame is helping me respond to questions concerning future growth and development whilst acknowledging the important achievements to date. This is a new project for me, as I said, it, it was between driving back and forward from York that uh, these, this question came to me. And I want to thank all of you really for joining in the, the conversation. So I'm, I'm gonna finish by reading a concluding statement, it's just a paragraph that is certainly concise and way too short, but will I hope point towards something to come. So as a practice that repeats the power of difference, community music will always be in flux, constantly adapting to change whilst actively seeking creative potentialities. With an emphasis towards productive processes, community music's evolution should be open to possibilities as yet unknown. Situated in the flow of becoming, those working in and advocating for community music would commit to fluid working practices that were contextually responsive, person-centered centered, and ethical. So community music would affirm its emergent character, mapping its histories and actualizations as multiple connectives unfolding through an imminent plane. As a complex assemblage, community music claims territory, but fleetingly. Its lines of flight, deterritorializing occupied environments and in its wake, providing opportunities for vibrant negotiations through disruption and critique. As a rhizomatic practice, community music develops and transforms in multiple ways. A desiring machine that craves other domains through which to connect, resulting in an expressive processes of production. Community music, a practice of difference and becoming and a rhizomatic desiring machine. So they are my summary paragraph of, of, uh, um, of some of my thinking where I'm at now. So I think we've got some good time now to just open up to a broad um, conversation around the question, how might community music develop? So the floor's open. Are there any questions or comments in response to, to what's been shared so far? It's quite a lot to take in that's brilliantly, by the way. I love the videos in there. I guess I'll I'll jump in if nobody else is is looking to um and so I guess it's when we're thinking of how how it might develop as someone who like a lot of people seem to seem to agree with have, have sort of stumbled across um community music in academia sort of by accident through a route of music education things like that that there seems to be a lot of what I would describe as community music activity which doesn't doesn't make it into those sort of conversations that sort of if it doesn't have some of the official derm of funding or sort of the power granted to it from associations with schools or organizations that a lot of that stuff seems to fall by the wayside and I think when we're looking to move forward how do we bring these these other areas of activity which aren't so definable in the way that um, a lot of the literature we see is how do we then bring those more grassroots work that's you know relates to community music's origins how do we then bring them into the fold of of what's been managed to be built at this quite sort of large forum of community musicians and music educators Thanks, Rory. You're, you're pointing towards some interesting things there that I, somebody who works in a, a university, there's those tensions, right? Because community music, for my inheritance, my historical inheritance, was a resistance to some of those things. We find ourselves, we, we've got the, 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 um, the, scholar, the development of scholarship and research, which, which, as I said, needs to be celebrated. But what are the concerns? What are the dangers? 
what are the dangers within some of this also you know so it, you know there's a lot of aspects to this question so and i think what you're pointing towards there rory is is how as it develops and it moves forward can we still stay true to some of some of not it's not everyone's inheritance historical inheritance but for some of us you know who grew up through it in a certain way how can we um still resonate with some of those foundational blocks if i can use that word in this session if i may come in i i think rory's raised a, a, a tension that i've actually felt throughout this afternoon really which is that we need the academic stuff we need the research we need the thinking because actually that does improve the practice and that does sustain the field by supporting the funding but are we in danger of creating this huge schism between academic approaches to community music and grassroots approaches to community music and where does the decolonizing of music education and community music fit within that if we sound like we're becoming more and more elite when we actually need to become less elite but still challenging and still provocative I, that, is, that was really well put, Graham. That's a great uh, point. Does anyone want to, can anyone would like to respond to Anne? I see you unmuted. Yeah. This is something we discussed in our group earlier, was having a commonality of language between academic and grassroots practitioners so that we can, that everybody can feel as included as possible and can access the conversation. And some of the terms that are used within academia are are not going to be understood or going to be exclusive. So finding some commonality of language to open up dialogue, I think is really, really important. And uh, the decolonizing, as, as Graham said, is still ongoing within, within that. And we need to share that far more. Yeah, so, that's, both, both of those points were great. And I also think they also talk, because um, I'm very conscious, of course, that the post-structural thing is around sort of often dead French people unfortunately right so I, I'm, I'm aware of the decolonization piece in this so i'm glad you both of you really have really raised that they're really good points hello how are you sorry there yeah so um i'm patrick from ireland and i'm studying actually music therapy and we were talking in our group there with um katrin and uh, uh paul and i i was very curious because as i say i'm very new and green in the whole thing what, where is the difference between a community music person and a music therapist and where where is the boundary where is the line from one thing into the next um obviously it's probably something i haven't studied yet maybe and maybe that will come up but you know both significant players in the community you know what i mean and then we were talking about probably one of the biggest downfalls for a lot of things is funding for for, for this and you know having the health services to to, to to allocate the funding for it. There's no doubt that either music therapy, community music, or any of the alternative therapies work for people in, in, in some way, you know what I mean? And, you know, my, I suppose my biggest burning question is where is the line of what is, how far a community music go person can go, and then it revolves into a music therapist, you know what I mean? Where, so. I, I, yeah, I appreciate the question, Patrick, and we can maybe point you towards some, um, writings that kind of looked at some of those those aspects but one of the things i'm interested in what you what you've said there is this idea of funding because again us as a field approaching this question how might community music develop also potentially puts us in much more of the front of the wave rather than being a slave to the to to what funding opportunities there are can and in that sense i know it's a it's something community musicians certainly in, in the in the UK have been trying to do is trying to instead of just being responsive to uh, calls for funding actually be part of the, the creation of that and understanding or at least having some senses of wh where we think the future of community music might be might help carve out more reciprocal relationships uh, with that which which I think is part of your question in terms of the lines between community music and music therapy i mean the, we we can certainly put you point you to some things that might get you thinking about that rather than tackling that on this call so i think we've got maybe a, a chance for one more 
question. Well, Lee, we've got some things coming up in the chat and Tim has also got his hand raised there, oh. Tim Palmer. So I don't we, know if we want to Let's go take on. Tim Palmer with his hand raised. Come on. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Lee. Um, I've been really interested. I've really enjoyed this afternoon. Thank you, everyone. I'm really interested in the idea that there's fractal questions coming up. There's questions that are the same questions but happening at different scales. Um, and there's so many tensions in this between, for example, um, the, the process and product, the, the music and the other entity that we're dealing with, the identities, the fixed, the, the, the crystallized, that these multiple tensions. And I, I'm wondering whether they exist as an individual, I mean, in me and perhaps as, as artists, you know, who are we, what are we trying to do? Um, and this might exist there in the research and the practice tension as well as a researcher, as a practitioner. How do I seek to make sense of what I'm doing? But also these exist in the relationships within our practice and the relationships within colleagues, but they exist within uh, any group work that we do. Uh, are, are we changing stuff? Are we reaffirming identity? Um, and then the same questions might also exist on a project basis. They might exist as a, as a practice basis amongst different projects within organizations. And the same questions might exist on a kind of national policy basis as well. Uh, what is community music trying to, to do? How are we trying to change, to reaffirm, to um, uh, develop process or product outcomes? And um, so the fractals within this and the idea that our rhizome, you look at it and it's tiny and it's still a rhizome and you look at it and it's massive and it's still a rhizome, just all at different scales. That, that image to me is coming out of this conversation. I, I'm not sure there's a direction in there. There's maybe just a kind of one of many ways of understanding. Now, I appreciate that, Tim. And um, as usual, these conversations generate more, more questions. Uh, and I'll just finish up because we've only got two minutes on the call and I know Joe's, Joe want to uh, close the call. But, you know, it's interesting, this idea of the tensions it's, and this idea of emergence these ideas of, of you know you know those things that are deep within our music practice where many of us use improvisations and those types of things i think it's also about trying to live and exist happily really happily in this undecided space in this kind of improvised space in a sense and embracing the tensions as as a real positive aspect of the practice that that we're in. Although, of course, we need to put those aside sometimes if we're dealing with different um, constituencies and different geographies in that sense. So look, uh, thank you very much for sort of engaging in this. As I said, it's a starting idea for me that ended up here at this conversation. I don't know what's gonna happen with it. Uh, I might generate an article or something out of it from some of my thinkings. Um, on the other hand, I just hope that as a collective, as a field, collaboratively, individually, this idea of how, or this question of how might community music develop, it seems to me very timely, as Joe said at the top of the hour, seems to me a timely question right, right now. So I hope, hopefully, this, um, this discussion has just kind of sparked some thinking for you. So thank you very much, and I'll pass you back to Joe. Thank you, Lee. And just following on from that sparking the discussion, yes, I can see some applause there. Can we just unmute and take a moment to uh, give uh, Lee a round of applause? <laughs> Thank you so much. And some microphone taps there. They were lovely. Um, I, Lee, I agree with you that um, uh, this is sparking much more conversation. And actually, Anne Jones and uh, Graham Dowd, your points uh, about language and decolonizing practices, I would personally really love to pick up on those threads another time. So ways that we can continue the conversation um, are as follows. Uh, you are all very welcome. I think it's okay for me to share your email address Lee in the chat so Rory will pop that in so any thoughts uh, you're welcome there to contact Lee you're welcome to continue to use the Google Docs if that's something that you access we'll keep the Google document open as a bit of a living document where you can pop in anything or revisit it if you want to but you might also want to continue the conversation on social media and this is where I pass over to Ryan um, and, and we've got Hannah and Emily on the call from York St John who've been working on that. It's not my domain, Sarah Fisher, you know, I've never been on Facebook or had an account 
account. So I'm passing over to Ryan now to talk about how we can continue those conversations in those spaces. Hello. So yes, yeah, so we, um, as the ICCM, we have um, two predominant social media accounts that we are currently using. Um, Facebook, which I will put the link into the chat box, and also um, the Twitter page at ICCM um, YSJ. And from there, um, I think the plan is that we're going to be putting some connecting questions um, from each of the events up. So there'll be a question next week centered around um, some of the emerging themes that have come from today's discussion. So feel free to give, our, give a like to our Facebook page and our Twitter page and, and engage in some of the conversations that, we, that we're hoping to have on there. Um, we also post as well the recordings from the videos on, with the YouTube link as well, so you'll be able to access any of the video recordings from there. Um, but yeah, have a check out of our social media presence. Thanks, Ryan. And I just add to that, I've seen some really great questions coming up in this chat. So if you want to put those on a place on Facebook and see what responses you get, you're very welcome to to have more of a chat there. Um, if you would like to join us again on an online event, then um, please come and join us on March the 11th. Our next event, dates for your diary going in the chat now, is with Dr. Diljeet Baku, who's now at the Royal North Northern College of Music, who will be presenting in our um, ICCM Presents series on ethical uh, community music and ethics. Uh, the link to Diljeet's event is there. Uh, and our next event for March uh, is on the 25th, which uh, is with Nicola Weidenbach and Amy Mallet, who will be presenting on a project around Parkinson's opera and looking at um, uh, participatory methodologies uh, in, in participatory practices. Uh, so you're very welcome to book and come along. I think that's enough signposting from me, except to say thank you so much and that we welcome your feedback. So any thoughts or comments, just drop us a line at the email or um, if you want to contact Ryan about social media, that's very welcome too. Um, I'm just looking around the room We've got a big room today to see if there's any other comments or anyone wanting to say anything else. Lee, I think we're about done for today. Impeccable timing, Lee, by the way. So we've got time for one more round of applause and we can all go home and maybe... <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all so much. We hope to see you at another event soon. Um, if you are a member of the ICCM group supporting this call, you're welcome to stay on. Otherwise, uh, sign off and see you later. Bye, bye all. Take care wherever you are. <laughs> bye.